Well, good morning and welcome to our worship service for Sunday, October 18th. And we are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us this morning, and we are glad that you are here. A reminder that we have began a new Bible study, which started last Wednesday. We meet via Zoom at 10 a.m. every Wednesday morning for eight weeks. And if you were not able to make the last one the last Wednesday, you're always free to join us, and we invite you to do that again this week. And if you'd like to be a part of that, just send me an email so I can include you in our email list when I send out the video that we are studying uh, in this uh, Bible study. Let us prepare our hearts and our minds for worship this morning. Today we give thanks that the Lord is always present with us. When we are grieving, God is with us. When we are in need of forgiveness, God is with us. When we are celebrating a joy, God is with us. When we come in need of grace, God is with us. When we kneel in weakness, God is present in our life. And we are grateful for his constant presence in our daily living. Let us praise God this morning. Let us lift our voices on high as we sing together. Praise our maker, peoples of one family. Let us turn our hearts and our minds toward God in prayer. Let us pray. Forgiving and welcoming God, we encounter you in a life lived in prayer, in contemplation and adoration, and above all in love. Today, as we hear about your love and goodness toward us, we humble ourselves before you in praise so that we can encounter the one who loves us and welcomes us like no other. Trusting in God's gracious and forgiving heart, let us together confess our sin. Gracious God, by your spirit, you call us to a life of hospitality, welcome, and generosity. Yet we are so often turned in on our own selves, worried about how to meet our own needs, and welcoming only those who we know and love. Forgive us, we pray. God of transformation, we know that you love a heart that is open, that is repentant, that is willing to change. There are so many whose hearts have turned hard, who pass judgment on others and ourselves and prioritize being right over being in right relationship with you. We pray that you soften the places in all of us that block us from loving freely with a full and generous heart. Open our hearts and our minds so that we can be a place of welcome and care for the stranger, the one who is different to us, the one who we might even consider our enemy. Create in us gentle hearts that easily pour out love so that those around us can draw people in. Breathe on us in these moments of worship with the power of your Holy Spirit so that we may live according to your way of grace and your way of peace. Lord, be with us in this worship this morning that we might praise your name and what might give you glory in all that we do. We pray this in Jesus' name who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 97. The Lord reigns, let the earth be glad. Let the distant shores rejoice, clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and consumes his foes on every side. 
His lightning lights up the world, the earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness and all people see his glory. All who worship images are put to shame. Those who boast on idols worship him above all gods. Zion hears and rejoices and villages of Judah are glad because of your judgments, Lord. For you, Lord, are the most high over the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. Let those who love the Lord hate evil, for he guards the lives of his faithful ones and delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light shines on the righteous and joy on the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you who are righteous, and praise his holy name. Amen. Let us sing together, I'm going to live so God can use me. time in our worship service for our mystery bag and Heather we have a mystery bag this morning this mystery bag comes to you from uh, Sarah Keller Sarah so thank you Sarah for participating and it's fairly light today so we'll see uh, what Sarah has decided to put in here today we have a dish towel and we have a dish towel one item in the bag Well, when I see this, the first story that comes to mind is when Jesus was on his knees and he took off his outer garments and he wrapped a towel around his waist and he washed the disciples' feet. Now, if there's anyone in that room that should have been on their knees washing the feet, it should have been any one of the disciples. But Jesus, the teacher, their master, their friend, got down on his knees, and one by one, he washed their feet. And he said, after he had washed their feet, go and do likewise. In other words, he said, this is the way I want to show you what love looks like. I want to show you what living in humility looks like. And Jesus acted that out in one of my favorite scenes in all of the Gospels, where Jesus humbles himself to wash their feet because he shows them what love in action really looks like uh, in a tangible way. And he says, I want you to go and do as I have done for you. And not just to those who were like them or those who believed like them, but to all people. Because remember, Judas was at that table too. That Jesus even washed his feet, and Jesus knowing what would become later. And even washed Peter's feet, knowing that he would deny him three times later. Yet in that moment, Jesus wanted to show them that love was above all these things. And Jesus asked us to go and do likewise. 
How are we loving those around us in our circles of influence? How are we loving the stranger that comes into our midst? How are we loving one another and acting it out in real ways? So I want to thank Sarah for putting the towel in there to remind, I don't know if this is where she was going with it, but to remind us this morning of what humble, humility, love in action looks like. Because Jesus, after he washed their feet, he said, love one another as I have loved you. And go from here and do likewise. So thank you once again for this, Sarah. We really appreciate you participating. Uh, and if you have an idea for Heather, please uh, don't be afraid to give her a call or a message. And she will certainly help you out. And also, Sarah, I'd love to know where you were going with this as well. If it was that way, wonderful. If not, I'd love to hear your story um, about uh, what the towel represents to you. And so now let's continue to worship as we sing, Will You Come and Follow Me? Gracious and loving God, we pray that as we come to your word and your message for us this morning, that you would open our hearts and our minds to new learnings and new understandings. We pray that the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 to 12. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. And our second reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 16 to 34. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to share 
A group of Epicurean Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we'd like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your object of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. See, you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the whole world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we, loo, we, we move and live and have our very being. As some of you, own, your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people began followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Demarius, and a number of others. This is the Gospel of Christ and the Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our passage today is, takes place in Athens, Greece, where Paul finds himself. And Paul is walking among the idols strewn throughout the city. And he gets into this conversation with those who were at this marketplace that love to talk and they love to debate things and the latest topics. And some of them sneered at him and some of them reacted violently and some of them accepted. And there was just a mix of reactions to what Paul was telling them. And they said, so let's take him over the city council meeting because they always have itching ears. In other words, the city council, all they did was talk and debate about things and they never actually got anything done. I'm not sure much has changed maybe today in our politics, depending on who you vote for. Who you, I'm not going to get into all of that. But Paul, Paul goes into the council and he says, they love to debate these things. They love that. And you've got a new teaching and I think they'll like what you have to say. And Paul says, I'm going to proclaim to you this God of one idol that you have over here, the unknown God, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But these were scholars, they were intellectuals or pseudo-intellectuals, they wanted to sound smart. I had a roommate in college who always told these jokes that weren't funny at all, but he just tried to make himself sound smart by them. He'd say, you know what, Barry, he says, Do you, counting is as easy, Counting in binary is as easy as zero one 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 zero. I mean, that's not a funny joke. He just tried to say it because other people say, "What are you talking about?" Or he left to go do grocery shopping one day, and he loved classical music. And all the note said was "Gone Chopin, Bach, and a minuet." So again, not that funny, but he just wanted to make himself sound smart. And that's what the politicians were doing here in Athens. And Paul walks into them with this new radical religion. And they are all ears. They want to hear what he has to say. So Paul began to speak. And he wouldn't disappoint. And he says, Athenians, I see how religious you are. He starts by complimenting them. Because I've walked around your city and I see many, many idols all throughout your city. You have gods to everything I can imagine. And they had a god to everything under the sun, including the sun. They had a god to Aphrodite, who was a goddess of love. 
and people would pray to her and adore her. They had a god named Poseidon, who was the god of the sea. If you went out to the sea, then Poseidon would help you on your journey. If you got caught in a storm in the middle of the ocean, then they would cry out to Poseidon to save them. They had Hermes, the god of flight, Ares, the god of war. They had Zeus, who was the god of all gods, the god of thunder, the god of lightning. They had a god to everything you can imagine. And so Paul looks around at all these gods, and he says, I can see you are very religious. Because if religion is determined by how many idols and how many gods you worship, then you people are the Mecca of all the world because you have so many around the city. You see, the Greeks wanted to cover all their bases, so they even had an altar to an unknown god. In case there was a god, they forgot. In case there was one that they left out. And Paul took advantage of that very moment. He says, I see you even have an altar to an unknown god. Well, that's today you're going to know who that God is. I'm going to make that unknown God known to you. And Paul says he's everywhere. This God is the creator of all things. This God that I'm proclaiming to you today. We are his daughters. We are his sons. And he has called us to repent from our sins and prove his power. He raised one man to new life again after three days of being dead. You're probably wondering how the politicians received Paul's message. Well, again, some sneered and mocked him, some ignored him, some debated with him. But there were a couple there, maybe more than a couple, there's definitely a couple that were mentioned by name, that actually believed what Paul was saying, and they became believers that day in this Jesus, this unknown God that he was proclaiming to them. Sometimes we like the known more than the unknown. There's an Arab chief who tells a story after he captured spies, he would give them the choice of the firing squad or the big black door. And they didn't know it was beyond the big black door. So most always, he said, only had one choose the door. The rest chose the firing squad because they had, didn't know what the big black door was. They knew what the firing squad was all about. And so the man said, well, what's beyond the big black door? He said, it's freedom. If you choose that door, you can just walk away. But no one wants to take the risk on the unknown. They would rather stay with the known even if they know it will lead to death. And that's what Paul is saying here. You have all these gods that are known that are made by human hands, but let me tell you about this God who is unknown but can be known by you. And I'm wondering what Paul would say today if he came into our midst. If we walked through our cities today, what would he say to the people of North America? He'd probably say, I can see that you are religious in every way. I've been watching all of you, and you have idols all over the place in your culture. Paul might go to a pedestal with money on it and say, look, I can see that you adore and you worship money. You argue over it. You fret over it. You worry if you don't have enough of it. And if you do have enough, you want more. And I can see that this has become an idol for you. He might put up point to a picture of a framed diploma or certificate and say, I see status is important to you, where you are in life and, and accomplishments and achievements and success. I can see that's another God that you have that you worship. He might walk over to a full-length mirror and say, and speaking of worshiping yourself, I have seen that you worship beauty and all these Hollywood movie stars that you love so much. And if you're beautiful, you have, must be of some worth. But if you're not, you're not that you're not, you're not as, as, of as much worth, worth as they are. Paul might go over to a pedestal with a football on it. And he say, I see how religious you are, because every Sunday I see you worshiping these teams and these, this sport, whether it's golf or baseball or sports or whatever it might be. I see that's another God that you have. You're all very religious here. I can see that. And after pointing to all those things, Paul would say, but let me tell you about a God who is unknown to you, a God who can be known, a God who is not designed or made by human hands, a God that it is not made of gold or silver or wood or stone. This God is as near as a prayer. This God is as near to you as your very breath. And if you trust in God, he will be present with you. Of all the gods I've known in my life, this is the God I trust. This is the God I believe in, Paul says. That may be what Paul would say to us today. Because it is essentially what he said to the Athenians. And his approach is important, I think. He starts by finding common ground, saying things like, I see you are very religious. He starts there. Notice Paul does not say, the Bible says. 
that's not a good starting point for any of us if we're going to witness for Christ. And we're talking about this in our Bible study as we began last week. We can't start with the Bible says, because most people today have never read it. Most people today haven't grown up with the Bible. And at that time when Paul was writing, Paul was writing 30 years, 20 to 30 years after the crucifixion. And Paul is also writing 40 years before the Gospels were even written. So Paul is writing in this in-between time when there was an Old Testament, but there's nothing, the New Testament wasn't even there yet. So we can't say the Bible says because the New Testament wasn't around and they didn't care about the Old Testament because it was the Jewish scriptures and the Greeks would not have cared about that. So he doesn't start with the Bible says. He starts with, I see you are very religious. He starts to find some common ground. And he points to all of their gods. And he starts with this unknown god, this altar that they had for that. And that's where he starts with their own culture, in their own time, in their own place, something they would understand. And he builds that common ground before he can start to tell them about who Jesus is. And the same is true of us. If we're going to be witnesses for Christ, we have to find that common ground, whatever it might be in our culture today. And then we start there. And we move into the discussion about who God is, but we can't start with that. And Paul even uses some of the phrases from the Greeks' own poets. In him we live and move and have our being. That might have been from a Greek poet in the 6th century. We are his offspring would have been a 3rd century Greek poet who said that. So Paul's using their own literature, their own culture, to meet them at this common place so that he can start to introduce them to this unknown God. The truth is, you don't need to quote the Bible or recite the history of Israel. You don't need to go to seminary in order to explain the gospel to someone. You don't need to have all of that to be able to explain Jesus to someone else that has never met Jesus. Start with where they are. Tell them of your experience. Tell them who Jesus is. Because that's the question that's important. Not what the Bible says. Who is Jesus? That's a fundamental question of our faith. You see, the gospel is heard differently wherever you go. That's because the gospel does not exist in isolation from human language or human culture or our own presuppositions about who God is or what the Bible is. The gospel is always in some way heard within our own context. Yes, it is good news, but how we hear that good news is not the same for all of us. How you hear the gospel, what the good news for the gospel for you is, is probably different than what the good news for the gospel for me is. We all hear it in different ways. We all hear something new and unique that someone else might not have experienced before. When Paul was speaking to the citizens of Athens, he said that people search for God. And he said, you don't have to search because God is already here in our midst. God is not that far away. Searchers, that's what we all are. And as I said in our Bible study this past week, even people who would not describe themselves as searching for something, I believe are searching for something. I think we're all searching for something, some meaning in life, a purpose in life, something bigger than ourselves. We're searching for hope. We're searching for grace. We're searching for forgiveness. Whatever it might be that we're searching for, we're all searching for something. Some seek health and happiness. Some look for family. Some look for companionship. Some, some look for love. Most of us, at one point or another, felt that there's something missing in our life. Maybe you feel that way right now. There's something missing. I don't know what it is, but I feel like there's something missing in my life. And so we search for that. And maybe not always actively, but we're always thinking about it. Searching isn't a bad thing. It shows that you want something deeper out of life. Are some quests more noble than others? Sure. Shallow goals typically produce shallow results. Fame and possessions, for example, don't usually yield deep satisfaction. Those pursuits, the shallow ones, can turn into idols if they replace the deeper longings of our heart. We tend to be pretty good at shallow pursuits. In fact, I think there's a lot, and me include all of us, we all pursue shallow things that, really, that lead to shallow results. Paul was preaching about a God who can go deeper into your life, that can bring meaning into your life, that can help you show 
your daily living in a new way of living, a new, a new perspective. And he was going to make this unknown God, that altar that they had set up to the unknown God, and he was going to remove the un and make it known. I'm going to make this God known to you. Paul uses concepts of love, compare, compassion, grace, truly an unknown God. They had never known a God like that. A God that would want to love us individually and collectively. A God that would give his own life for us. A God that can raise people from the dead. A God that shows us grace. A God that forgives. This is all foreign to them. It indeed was a very unknown God. In our day and age today, people no longer like to be called religious. Some people like to be called spiritual rather than religious. And much like the ancient Greeks, most people in our society today can name hundreds of concepts of who God is. And if you ask them who Jesus is, they'll probably give you different opinions on who Jesus is. And just like the ancient Greeks, so many people today have varying ideas of what God looks like. And some have no concept of God at all. But for all this wide-ranging religion or spirituality or whatever you want to call it, Paul's words in our text for this morning would still be met with blank stares, even today, if you were to start to explain this unknown God to people. They could, just can't believe that somebody would love them as they are. They just can't believe that a God would be that intimate with them, that, would, that personal with them. They can't believe that God is really that present. Such a God is simply unknown to Paul's time and in our own time. God is some sort of higher something up there beyond the wild blue yonder that we really don't know him. And he's unknowable. But God is known. God can be known. God is very present with us in a very real way. And he is as close as our very breath. He is a prayer away. He is waiting for us to know who he is in a deeper way. After all the argument goes, if there really was a God who loved them, then why do bad things happen in this world? Why is there terror? Why is there hate? Why do all these things take place? Why are we going through what we're going through right now if there really is a God that loves us? Why does he allow us to go through that? Well, we're not going to get into all of that today because that's a sermon for another time. But God is in the, in the midst of that, very present, even in the midst of those difficult times. When faced with the wise questioning of this world, even the most devout believers can begin to doubt that God really exists and that God can really love someone like us. That kind of thinking is everywhere we turn because people don't really know who God is. People don't know what God has done. But we can witness to others and tell people about Jesus as Paul was doing here. But we have to meet them on a common ground. We can't say the Bible says because that's People don't know what the Bible says. They don't have that foundation anymore. So we have to start with where they are at culturally, whatever their context might be. Wherever it is, it might be a common interest you have with somebody else. You start there, and then you can have that conversation later on. The professor, N.T. Wright, said he'd have new seminary students come in, and they would say that they don't believe in God. And he'd say, well, tell me about the God you don't believe in. And they'd say, well, I don't believe in a God who's judging and is, who has a thumb on everything. I don't believe in a God who picks and chooses who lives and who dies. I don't believe in a God who would allow bad things to happen to this world. I don't believe in God. And N.T. Wright would always say, yeah, I don't believe in that God either. But let me tell you about the God I believe in. And then he would do what Paul did. He would start to tell them about this unknown God. This God who is God full of grace and mercy and love and compassion for all people. In the person and work of Jesus, all the doubts and fears and anxieties over the unknown God disappear. Because Jesus says, I want to come into your life and I want to be a part of your life and I want you to live in a way that reflects who I am and what I've shown you in the way I have treated people. And what I have done in those three and a half years of ministry that Jesus had with his disciples, he modeled what it looked like to be a believer of Jesus Christ. He modeled what it looked like to love one another. We talked earlier in our mystery egg time where Sarah put the towel in the bag and we talked about Jesus washing the disciples' feet in humility and in love and said, go and do likewise. 
Well, that's what Jesus is asking us to do here. And Paul is proclaiming this Jesus to people who had never heard of him before. And some of them believed on that very day and they came to follow Paul and follow who Jesus was. Are we any different than the Greeks at that time? I think ours too is a golden age. Computers, space travel techniques and medicine that the world never dreamed of years ago. Engineering, engineering feats that seemed impossible a few years ago. And we too are looking for ultimate value and meaning and purpose in life and we're not gonna find them in those things. We're going to find them in the person of Jesus Christ. If we listen to our culture as well as Paul did, we would discover that longing for God is beneath the surface of almost everyone you will meet. I believe everyone is searching. They might not articulate it that way. They might not describe it that way. They might not even say that they are searching, but we all are. We're searching for something. Life doesn't add up to anything. I don't really mean anything to anybody. I'm just a number. I wish I could find something meaningful that won't disappoint me. Do you ever yearn for something better? Do you ever ache for the plight of others in this hurting world? Are you ever dissatisfied with your own life? Then today I invite you to know this unknown God, because this God can be known. And all those things that we're searching for can be found in this person of Jesus Christ. How do churches grow? Churches that grow come to know Jesus. Churches that don't grow come to know the leader. We need to know who Jesus is. That's the question. We need to understand who Jesus is to each of us because he is something different to all of us. Watch how God will work when we give God glory in all that we do. Watch how God will work in our lives, in our churches, and in our communities if we give our lives and our churches and our very time to who God is and we act out those things, those acts of faith, those acts of love that God asks us to do. And then God will be glorified. And then God's name will be lifted on high. And then this unknown God will be made known. I invite you this week to go and find someone you can share your faith with maybe it's a family member maybe it's someone you work with but start somewhere that's a on common ground with that person don't start with the bible don't start with sunday school don't start with your faith start with something that is going to be common to both of you and then share who jesus is and sometimes we can share jesus without ever saying anything just by showing them love and kindness unexpected acts of kindness generosity you know someone has said that we are to preach the gospel at all times and if necessary use words amen let us sing together praise him praise him jesus our blessed redeemer Redeemer for us.
Once again, turn our hearts and our minds to our God in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, there is no other God who can compare to you in heaven or on earth. Even the highest heavens cannot contain you, and yet you walk among us. We have experienced your presence in our midst and have felt your guiding hand in our life. You have faithfully kept your covenant with us and shown unfailing love to all who trust in you. Help us to receive the free gift of forgiveness that you offer. Reconciling God, too many times we would rather gossip about those who have hurt us than speak to them privately. We would rather parade our wounds for all to see than quietly work together for reconciliation. Help us choose the harder road, the road that opens possibilities for real healing, real forgiveness, and real growth in your spirit. Help us place the best interest of our community of faith above our own need. Lord, you love us and you forgive us. So today we come before you with confidence, believing that you hear the prayers we offer and that you'll respond in your time. Gracious God, we bring to mind now in these moments those people who are in need of our prayers today, those who are ill or anxious, those who are lonely or sad, those who are despairing or defeated, those who are hungry or homeless, those whose relationships are breaking apart, those who are bullied or abused, those who are grieving the loss of a loved one, those who are anxious or afraid. We pray for those who are in the hospitals today. We pray for those at home with illnesses and recovering from treatments or surgeries. We pray for those in nursing homes and those who are homebound. We pray for all who need your grace and your presence in their life, that you might meet them at the point of their need. In silence now, we make our own specific prayers for those in our hearts and minds today. Lord God, in your presence alongside Jesus Christ with help from the Spirit, may we go into this week to live out these prayers through our lives. Gracious God, hear our prayer. Look with mercy on your gathered people, even though we gather separately in these times. Go with us as you have gone with your people throughout history. Give us a desire to do your will in all things, so that the whole world may come to know who you are, and that you alone are God, and that we are your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Go from here in the grace of God the Father and the love of Jesus Christ the Son and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Each of you go now in peace. Amen. It's been good to be together. It's been good to worship as a family of faith. Always plain for all to see. We're as different. Well, once again, we thank you so much for joining us for our worship this morning. 
We hope that it has been a blessing to you as it always is to us. And until we meet again, may you stay well, stay safe, and stay connected. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us for worship today. If you would like to financially support our Little White Church on the Bay, please send your check made out to Wasaga Beach Community Presbyterian Church or WBC Presbyterian Church and mail it to Wasaga Beach Community Presbyterian Church, 208 Mosley Street, Wasaga Beach, Ontario, L9Z 2K1, Attention Treasurer. Your financial support is much appreciated during this time. Tax receipts will be issued for donations of $20 and more. Stay safe, stay healthy, and follow all COVID-19 safety protocols. Thank you. For more information about upcoming services and events, please join us on Facebook by searching Wasaga Beach Presbyterian Community. You can also reach us via email at barry.donor70 at gmail.com or by phone at 705-429-9963. And be sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel so you can receive notifications for upcoming worship services online. Thank you.